If you're working in pen and wash, the usual pen that you grab is probably something like this. A micron pen, fine liner, call it what you want. But my mission is to try and persuade everyone to have a go at pen and wash using dip pens, because you've probably got one lurking at the bottom of a bag somewhere that you never use. So I'm going to show you how I painted this dodo using both a traditional pen and nib and this really rather beautiful glass dip pen. My name's Liz Chatterton. I'm a professional artist based in Berkshire and every week I try and bring you a tip or a trick that I wish someone had told me about ages ago. And this week it's all part of my mission to persuade you that dip pens are wonderful. Dip pens are brilliant fun to draw with and really expressive. They, they bring so much more to the party than just using a little fine line or something like that. You can add watercolour or you could add washes of diluted ink and keep it monochrome. Or of course you can do only pen work, but I don't particularly like that. I like the extra sort of movement and volume that applications of washes bring. This is called a helmet vanger, this bird, which I've, I've done a couple of ways, but today I thought I'd draw a dodo. And the pens I'm going to be using are these dip pens. Um, I've got a few different holders with nibs that I've put in. Uh, these are calligraphy ones and they've got a little bit on the back, I don't even know what those are called, that helps it hold extra ink so it acts as a little reservoir. I've got another more flexible nib and then I've got a beautiful glass pen which I'll show you which is lovely for a very fine line. I've got some ordinary black Indian ink which I've put out into a little pot for dipping and I should be good to go. I would always recommend just doing a quick test of all the nibs you've selected. You know, if you haven't used them for a while or they're brand new, just have a little look at the sorts of marks you can achieve with them. See how they react on the paper surface that you've chosen. It's worth looking at, you know, say, how wet it writes as well, because that'll impact on your drying time and also <laughs> the distinct likelihood of you smudging it if it's a really wet sort of pen. That's a far broader one but I can get a fine line if I go sidewards and presumably if I vary the pressure yeah I get a nice mark and that goes on a lot longer because it's got that little reservoir. I've not used dip pens before you do need to prepare the nib if it's a brand new this one. This is my little glass dip pen. What you'll find with the glass dip pens, if they've got spiral grooves in the nib, they hold a little bit more ink than if they've got straight grooves. And I always love the fact that one dip goes on for so jolly long. You wouldn't expect that from a glass pen. You would think, oh, I'm gonna be dipping all the time. But actually, well, gosh, so long from one dip. So you can really get quite expressive with the dip pen, but the line is very even. Pressure variation doesn't make any difference there. And you can get them from very plain and simple to absolute works of art in their own right. One thing you've got to be super careful with is when you dip it, that you don't whack the, the nib on the bottom of your pot and actually break it because that makes you cry. The other thing just to think about is maybe how the, the ink is going to behave on the paper. I'm just wetting it because I love Indian ink. I've got watercolour paper here. It's £140 or 300 grams per square metre. And look at that ink go. Wow just explosions of inky loveliness so it might we might think how we could apply that and then of course you could just paint with the ink. Just wash your brushes out really carefully 
afterwards because the ink is waterproof and that's a good point actually always know what your ink's going to do make sure it is actually waterproof on the paper you've chosen because sometimes the ink and the paper interacts and what's waterproof on one surface isn't always fully waterproof on another i absolutely adore dodos and i've sketched this dodo out onto a piece of watercolor paper about 40 centimeters square i think it's just on and then i've got i've got a little print out here it's worth thinking what you want the ink to do and what you want the wash to do so i might want the um the the wash to capture that light on its sort of wrinkles on its beak or say on this really puffy chest or its little white floofy tail and i might want the ink to to work hard in the shadows i'm certainly not putting every line in let me tell you the average chicken has eight thousand feathers apparently um so i'm not going to do eight thousand feathers but I am going to start with that lovely eye. I want to give my dodo a sparkle. I mean, this is obviously an, an old sort of illustration, but I, it has got very stylized lines, and that's not what I'm going for here. I do want to really vary the marks, and so I'm, I'm going to just let them go for a wander in places. So the um, wrinkles on its nose are beautiful. I want to make sure we capture that. And that sort of forlorn smile as if it knew its fate. So there I'm doing a little bit of hatching as well as I did continuous line work there. And it's really a case of working out what sort of lines you feel suit the surface that you're drawing. Um, you could be very precise with your cross hatching. You could be very expressive and loose. The choice is entirely yours. I'm going to leave this top line uninked because I want the watercolour to play its part there a lot more. I am going to pull that round there. And again, though I am inking its sort of little bouffant hairstyle, the top will be more sort of going down to the watercolour. And it's a case of definitely doing you know less is more you cannot take the ink off once it's on the paper you have to live with it but you can always add a little bit more so I would say my aim is to continue to ink till I'm about or oh, say 90% of what I think I want and if that's um, and then stop and put whatever wash on that I'm going to do and I can always add more ink once the washes are dry. And actually, to be honest, even though usually I think, oh, that's about 90% of the way, quite often I get to the end and realize that actually I was 100% of the way all along. As it comes down its chest, you start to get more defined feathers. So I'm sort of opening out the continuous line and I'll sort of start to open out and maybe sort of mark in slightly more feathery marks to get those lovely overlaps of of feathers that we start to see as it comes down its chest. Now if you're do working like this and going back into an area there's a huge danger that you're going to drag hand through wet work. If you're concerned about that use a bit of kitchen towel to rest your hand on. Doing quite a lot of work with this pen I could change it and to change the weight of the line if I want but actually it's behaving itself rather nicely so uh, if it's doing what I want there's not much point in actually changing it. So here 
I'm coming in with that glass pen and just starting to put in some of the cover, cover feathers on its wing. I mean, they were flightless birds, but obviously they still had little wings. And because of the amount of um, ink that this can hold and the fineness of the lines, it's quite fun for doing really quite scribbly marks, I think. I think the metal dip pen's possibly a bit more fun for um, doing sort of more precise work. You can see the sort of difference of the marks all, all developing. As you're doing this, be aware that the first dip or the first mark after a dip is often a lot wetter because there's there's more ink on the pen so that is a danger sort of period of when you might find that um, you get splots or or it gets very wet and takes a long time to dry that's not a problem it's just something to be aware of should you put in a wrong line or a line that you're really you really hate you know don't panic because you will see it because you are the, the the maker of these lines but other people are very unlikely to so it's worth putting in the correct line and often that's enough to distract your eye from the wrong one um, if not there's usually an opportunity to do a bit of camouflage, so really don't panic. And the last thing you want to do is to try and get rid of the lines because that's when you end up with super smudging, horrible marks. So it's quite nice to have a few areas where things are possibly a little bit more precise or a little bit more detailed, but just aiming for that balance. And then we come into its scaly legs. I don't know if you have ever spent any time looking at a say a chicken's leg or bird's legs but they are scaly and very reptilian so it's worth maybe emphasizing some of that um, I'm doing again sort of fairly continuous line And it's got really big fat sort of worm-like toes. Most birds have four toes with sort of three forward, one back. But if you think about things like chickens or pheasants, they have a, a fifth toe which is turned into the spur sort of out the back of their leg for, for fighting. Um, I think ostriches only have two toes. It's worth thinking, making sure you get things anatomically correct. I'm not aiming for any shape of form of, you know, accuracy here. Um, this dodo would probably not recognise itself in uh, a mirror. But I don't want uh, someone who's got better ornithological understanding than me look and think mm, you got that wrong love um, I want them to enjoy the picture rather than be annoyed at the wrong number of toes or that they're facing in the wrong direction right let's come on to the second leg making sure I don't smudge that and I'm going to start with that sort of fuzzy mark which will be quite nice for contrasting with the, the feathers of the wing above and be careful to make sure the marks go in the direction that the feathers would be growing so they do grow down the leg you accidentally chip the nib of your glass pen say you were a little enthusiastic whacking it into a bottle of um, ink or, or you drop it or whatever you potentially might be able to save it by just smoothing the nib down on um, some very very fine sort of wet and dry sandpaper um, not guaranteed to work but you've got nothing to lose if you've already managed to break break that nib especially if it's one that you are very fond of because the bit I'm really looking forward to doing is 
his little pom-pom tail. Um, that's really beautiful. Now I don't want this to look too cartoony and that obviously does but we can work on that. So it really was a very floofy little pom-pom. So we need to continue down its back. We know the light's coming here, so I reckon the light would be catching the top of this pom-pom, but also the top of the back. So I'm going to just be aware of that. quite like how those are coming as marks, so we might just carry on sort of spreading some of those out there. And then I think we start to get into more the hard feathers, similar to these ones down here. So we'll sort of again repeat some of those marks. Rather than going for this jagged look, we'll use a new little mark just invent things you know it's like a lots of W's joined together and overlapping do you remember me saying stop at 90% um, and you'll probably discover that it was nearer to 100 I reckon I'm on about 88% at the moment so I'm just putting in a few marks around here I wanted to sort of slightly echo what I did around its chest but then I think that is probably enough on the inking front. Once I'm happy I'm going to put my pen down and let it dry really thoroughly. I can use a hairdryer on it if I want to. Um, I can go off and you know do something else, come back to it, but I do need to make sure that everything is really dry so that we don't get any hideous surprises when I put something wet over the top. When it's fully dry, I'll also erase any pencil marks that I don't want showing through. I might need to keep some pencil marks like round the beak because that will be my guideline and then we'll take it from Just there. before we get on to the, the painting side, because this is pretty much dry, you should wash off your pens and make sure the ink doesn't dry on them. And obviously you could wash them off in uh, just water and then really dry thoroughly or someone told me um, that you can use a potato to clean off your nib. Is that funny? It seems to work so if you're out and about no water you want to clean off a nib you can use a potato but if you've got these little reservoirs on the back they will get stuck in the potato so you need to take it off first. This is the exciting bit where we can bring our, our lovely dodo back to life. I've put a few colours in a palette. Um, the tiniest smidge of lemon yellow um, for its eye. I have to say no one seems to be terribly clear on what um, uh, the dodo actually you know what colour it actually was. Some people show with with the eyes being blue, some yellow. I thought I'd go for sort of flamingo colouring, so flamingos have very yellow eyes, just sort of pale. You can see why it only needed to be a smidge. Um, the beak is often shown, the end of it's often shown as black with the face being a more orangey yellow then grey plumage a whitish wing and definitely the white pom-pom tail and the feet being sort of yellowy orange as well so that's the sort of colouring I'm going for and I thought 
rather than going for a very neutral grey, which this is, if I mix some blue in with it, I thought that would be a lot more interesting. And the blue and orange is a complementary colour, so if I get some orange round it, even though this is effectively a grey and white bird with orange, orangey yellow feet, I thought it would just jazz it up a little. As I've got my paint on my brush, I'm going to start on the head and pull some of that bluey grey down. But I'm not going to be beholden to my lines um, because it's nice to let that watercolour have a role to play. Here it's going to be darker because it's more in sort of the shadow and down into its foot. I've selected transparent colours apart from that lemon yellow because, you know, I've just spent ages doing this blooming line work. I don't want it to disappear under sort of quite opaque colours. Might do a little bit of sort of dry brushing. So dry brushing is when you've loaded your brush, take off some of the um, paint and then drag it across the surface and the texture of the paper shows through. Now the tail is, I say, white, but let's get some shadow in and use some blue in there just to give a little bit of shape and interest in there. We said, didn't we, that we thought that the beak was quite dark and most are depicted as having quite a, a shine to them, especially that end bit. The face is usually depicted as being yellow. Now I am concerned if I put some yellowy orange through its face now with all that bluey grey wet, I'll end up with a green face, which is not what I'm intending. So rather than doing that now, I'm going to let that dry. So again, we're trying to emphasise the scaliness of its feet. So just Make sure our brush marks do Might that. Put a little bit of that blue through its toenails in places. We have decisions now about whether we want to soften, say, his fluffy bum and his fluffy legs, or even the fluffy back of the head. So I'm going to use a little spritzy spray. Just get a little bit of softness of edges there softens things so much that it becomes a blob. That's absolutely not what I'm aiming for. Oops. But just to give a variety of edges. See, that's a nice mark now. So I need to let that dry. I'm going to introduce that yellow face. Now that it's dry and I haven't got the danger of it going too green on me. Grey, you know, because I think there'll be a little bit of shadow under there. And I can just introduce a little bit more tone and variation in this sort of final bit of detail here. And then, this should be the fun part, I plan to use orange as a background, um, say as that complementary colour. So I've put that line in and I'll put line in round here and then with clean water I'm going to pull that colour away. So effectively, I'm painting 
the background to capture what well, given it a right Elvis hairstyle um, no bad thing nothing wrong with that but to uh, capture some of those lights that I wanted to make sure we're in there I want to do exactly the same round its chest so you can either put pure pigment down or put water down and then drop the pigment in or indeed do a little of both some more captured light here capture some light on the top of that foot and just see I sort of caught some light on top of that foot so I want to capture light round the back of that there maybe sort of round here and actually the big advantage of turning your work is you start to see it in a fresh light rather than as as you think it's going to be emphasize the pom-pom nature of that tail by leaving these sort of little semicircle whites around there let the color go for a bit of a one yeah then i'm going to come around the back here don't want to make this background too busy because I've got two quite strong areas of the orange I think I do need to have just another third area of the strong orange just to balance things up I think it needs a bit of decent orange sort of down here just increasing a bit of shadow and form sort of under that wing so the wing definitely sort of stands out as white against the grey body. Okay, so there is my dip pen and wash dodo. I'll let that dry, double check everything and then we're done.